Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. And as we get into chapter 10, this chapter has been called the Table of Nations. And here you have the beginning of all of the various nations of the world, the various ethnic groups with these sons of Noah. These are the generations of the sons of Noah. Seth is probably the one who put these generations together. We follow for a little bit the line of Ham, a little bit the line of Japheth, and then when we get to the line of Shem, we continue to follow the generations from Shem because it is from Shem that Abraham will come. It is from Abraham that the nation will come. It is from the nation and Abraham, of course, that the seed Christ will come. And so we'll continue to follow the line down to Christ. But the others will follow for a few generations to establish uh, their, their ethnic groups that sprung from them. Then we'll leave them go because the whole message really is centering and zeroing down towards Jesus Christ. So many names are not given. Many of the families are not named and all. It isn't intended to be a complete historical record, but only a record that will lead us to Abraham, which will lead us to David, which will lead us to Jesus Christ. Once we've come to Jesus Christ, it wasn't necessary to keep the genealogies anymore. God has proven that Jesus Christ was, as promised, the son of David the son of Abraham, the son of Adam. So, that's all that's necessary to follow that line that leads to Christ. Now, the sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Medi, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. Gomer was more or less the father of the... Uh, Ancient uh, Sumerians. Magog were the Scythians, the area of Russia. And Madai was the father of the Medes. Javan, the Greeks. Tubal and Meshach, uh, they believe that Meshach actually is the ancient uh, Muscovy, modern day Moscow. And Tubal the modern Toblensk. And Tyrus, of course, is the Thracians. And so we see that basically you're getting into the Asian European nations uh, as descendants from Japheth. Now we take one of the sons, Gomer, the first one listed, and we have the Germanic people, Ash. Kenaz, and uh, Ripha and Togarma. Togarma is thought to be the Armenians, but the Ashkenaz, more or less the Germanic people coming again from Japheth. And by these were the islands of the Gentiles divided, actually Tarshish and, and so forth. So you're getting into the area of Europe, Scandinavia, uh, of course on into Ultimately, England, all the descendants, the Caucasian race, descendant from Japheth. Now, the sons of Ham, Cush and Seba, Havila, Sapta, Rama, and all of these various names. We're not going to try and go through them all. But they basically went south and uh, populated the areas of Africa. Also, a uh, portion of them uh, the descendants of Canaan were Sidon, which were the Phoenicians. Uh, the sister city of Sidon, of course the city Sidon upon the northern coast of the Mediterranean, uh, the sister city of uh, Tyre, which were the uh, Phoenicians, the Jebusites who inhabited the area around Jerusalem, and in verse 17 there's Sinite. 
Now it is felt that some of the inhabitants of the Sinites moved east and were the uh, Chinese descended from this particular branch. And it is interesting that the Chinese are still called Sino uh, people. And, and you read of the Sino uh, Japanese War, for instance. And, and the name is still holding. And many of the Chinese names beginning with this S-I-N. Uh, so, uh, from uh, Ham, Africa, on over into the Far East and the area of Canaan. Now, he does stop with uh, one of the descendants and when he gets to Cush, begat Nimrod. And he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Instead of a mighty hunter before the Lord, it should be translated, he was a mighty tyrant in the face of the Lord. Uh, the hunting was the hunting of men's souls. Nimrod became a leader in apostasy, a developer of a great religious system later to become known as the Babylonian religious system system or the mystery Babylon, that whole religious system was begun by Nimrod. Now, his mother, Semiramis, was later to be called the Queen of Heaven and to be worshipped. It was her claim that Nimrod was actually born without the benefit of a father, that he was born while she was a virgin. Nimrod was known for his hunting prowesses. A great man with a bow. In those days, the people were probably, because of their uh, primitive type weapons, very fearful of the wild animals. The lions and the tigers and leopards and so forth. And, and he was known as a protector of the people because of his ability and skills in hunting but one day while hunting boar, a wild boar turned on him and gored him. And he supposedly was dead for three days, lying there in the woods. And after three days, his life returned. And so they began to celebrate his resurrection by coloring eggs and having great festivities in the springtime of the year. Incidentally, his birth was December 25th. And they usually celebrated his birth by giving of gifts, drunken orgies, and cutting trees and decorating them with silver and gold in their homes. And this is just a few generations after Noah. The worship of his mother, Semiramis, Queen of Heaven. The whole thing, Satan's counterfeit of God's intended work, began with Nimrod. And when you start reading the history of the Babylonian religion, the way they set up the uh, celebrations and all, you will be absolutely shocked at the historic church and how much of the activities of the historic church were borrowed directly from Nimrod, who was also known as Tammuz and Marmaduke, several names, Ashtart, Semiramis, the various names for his mother who was worshipped. 
and actually the name Easter coming from Ashtarti. It's amazing that this Babylonian system could have so thoroughly infiltrated the church. But God brings Nimrod into the, into the record here. And uh, the beginning of the kingdom of Babel, verse 10, and it was he who inspired the people to build this tower that would reach into heaven. It was he who began to inspire them to the worship of the stars, the beginning of astrology, and all of these things began in this ancient Babylonian religion. The tower really literally not to reach into heaven, but the tower was to worship. It was an observatory where they would go and worship the stars, the constellations and so forth. And many such towers have been uncovered in the archaeological diggings there in the Babylonian plain. They were areas of worship. So the descendants of Ham. Then in verse 21 we, be, we come to the descendants of Shem. Also the father of all the children of Eber. It is from Eber that we get the name Hebrew or the Hebrews. So Abraham was not the beginning of the idea or the name of the Hebrews. It came from Abraham's uh, ancestor Eber. And so Shem, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. The children of Shem uh, are listed here for you. And then the children of Aram. Uh, and we're, we're going to narrow down to Eber because we want to follow Eber. Eber had two sons. The name of one was Peleg. And in his days was the earth divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. Now, uh, this idea of the earth being divided, there are some who try to relate this to a current scientific theory of the continental, the, uh, the, the continent uh, dividing, you know. The, um, the, the continents have been drifting apart that originally there was only one land mass, but this continental drift theory that is uh, a current theory in some scientific areas and they, some of them point to uh, this reference of Scripture and it was in the times of Peleg that the earth was divided. However, if you'll follow the chronological charts and all, you'll find out that Peleg lived in the days of the Tower of Babel and it was at the Tower of Babel that the earth was really divided into the ethnic groups and so that is probably what the reference is to the division of the earth into the ethnic groups following the Tower of Babel experience rather than a scripture that would somehow uh, lend support to the continental drift theory. So, uh, uh, that's the way it is. It, it could refer to the continental drift, but more than likely the reference is to the division of the earth from the Tower of Babel. Among the names here in the descendants, we do find the name Jobeb, which could very well be the Job of the Scriptures. And so, uh, I guess that's a little further down when we get into the descendants of Abraham. Now in chapter 11, the whole earth was of one language and one speech. Probably Hebrew. Because in the earlier record of uh, the book of Genesis, the names of the people were Hebrew names that have Hebrew meanings. And so the original language was perhaps the Hebrew language itself. But the whole earth was of one language, one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there and they said one to another 
let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. Now, uh, this is an interesting thing because it shows that very early after the flood, uh, they had brick kilns and rather than just building their houses out of rocks, uh, they uh, were advanced to the state of, of making bricks and putting them in the kiln, burning them thoroughly. So, uh, rather than just adobe kind of buildings, they were now using a mortar with a cured brick or a burned brick and uh, they began to build of course, the city of Nineveh, the city of Babylon, all began to be built in this period by Nimrod himself. And so they said, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, God's command was to actually fill the earth. It's an attempt to uh, sort of... Uh, Countermand God's commandment. Lest we be scattered abroad throughout all the earth. Let's, let's join together. Let's just, you know, congregate in this area. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Now, again, uh, we're describing the activities of God in human terms. Uh, as though uh, God were coming down and looking things over. Uh, in, in reality, God is omnipresent. He was watching the thing the whole while. The Lord said, Behold, the people is one. And they all have one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. The developing of this religious system. Now, it is very possible that originally... God placed the stars in the heavens for signs and that the gospel is actually given in the zodiac. The virgin, the lion. But as Satan has always taken the things of God and twisted them and perverted them, so from the original message that God had placed there in the heavens of His plan for the ages, that there was that perversion of it into what is the modern astrology, which began way back again in the Babylonian era. Here in, ba in Babel, where they were going to build this tower as an observatory to observe the constellations and so forth of the sky. But... It is quite possible that originally the gospel was there indeed in the stars as far as the message of God to man. Now, it would seem that the Magi who came from the east to find the Christ child were reading correctly the heavens. We have seen His star in the east. We've come to worship Him. And that they were reading truly the signs that God had placed there. Now the Bible says that God has placed the stars for signs and for seasons. And it is very possible that originally there was indeed the message of God in the stars but has been perverted, as I say, into the modern astrology and the perversion began way back there whether they began to look at the stars for the influence over their lives rather than looking to God. And so God in His Word puts down the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators, those who sought then to govern their lives by the influence of the stars upon them and so forth. 
And, and God really speaks out very heavily against that in the prophecy of Isaiah. But it is an ancient, ancient thing, the horoscopes and all. But as with so many things, it is possible that in the beginning it was pure and had a true message of God, but it has been perverted as time has gone on. And so God, seeing this development, said, let us go down and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel or Babel, whichever pronunciation you prefer. It really is a word that just sort of, it was a word that was adapted because of what the sound sounded like. Just like the word barbarian is a word that was developed by the Greeks and, and the word barbarian in Greek literally, literally is barbar. And anybody who didn't speak Greek was a barbar because your language sounded so funny. So anybody who didn't speak Greek, they just considered them uncultured and said, oh, they're a barbar. You know, it just means that they talk some other language rather than the culture Greek. And, and so from that we get the word barbarian, but it, it originally was just a, 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 you know, just a sound that they made, uh, an unintelligible sound by which they were sort of mimicking any language other than Greek. It's barbar. Oh, he's a barbar. And uh, so this babel is the same thing. It's a mimicking of a sound that was not understood. Babel. Just it's somewhat like the barbar babel, and it's just an uh, you know I don't understand what you're saying. Uh, you, what do you mean baba? You know or babel? <laughs> and uh, so uh, the word has come to mean confusion, lack of understanding. And so they called the name of the place Babel, because the Lord did there confound or confuse the languages of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And so, at this point, the people who were speaking... And of course, this was a tremendous miracle, indeed. uh, The development of all of these languages. Now, the interesting thing about languages is that many times we think that the English language, because we grew up with it, you know, is such an excellent language in communicating ideas. And we think, you know, people who are living in, say, primitive cultures, in Stone Age cultures, surely they must have a primitive form of language. Ours must surely be a highly cultured form of language, the English language. And they must have very primitive language. But it is an interesting thing that many of the primitive cultures have the most complex languages. Highly complex languages. Much more so than English. And thus there is great difficulty in translating into many of these Languages of primitive people. You think, oh, it would be easy to translate. You know, the man went to church. But some of these primitive cultures have so many words for man. So you'd have to know if the man was one that you knew well or you knew slightly. Because they have one word for man that you know well and another one for a man that you know slightly. Then they'd have to know whether you liked the man or not. And then you'd have to know whether or not you respected him. And actually they have maybe 20 different words for man. So you'd have to know all kinds of things about this man before you'd know which word would fit the text or the translation. Now the word he went. 
Did he go once in his life? Or did he go occasionally? Was it something that he was accustomed to doing or something that was rare for him to do? And, and so even in the verb, you have so many different words that would describe it that you get into the translating and really you want to throw up your hands and quit because these languages are so many times so much more complex. I have a friend who was translating the Gospel of Mark into the Choco dialect in Panama. And he came to the place where he was working with his uh, translating helper and he came to the place where Jesus spit on the ground and, and made mud and put it in the blind man's eye and told him to go to the pool of Siloam and wash it out. So, in translating this word spit, the natives said, but how did he spit? <laughs> you know, there's many different ways to spit. <laughs> well, we only have one English word. But the Choco Indian has so many different words. You have a different way of spitting. And he didn't, and of course, how do you know which word it is? You know, we don't know what word it is. And because, you know, they, they have so many different words. He said, well, he said, did he, <coughs> did he hunt and spit? Or did he pick up the did he pick up the dirt in his hand and just spit and mix it up? Or did he spit on the ground and mix it up? Or did he put the dirt in his eye and spit in his eye and mix it up? And he would have a different word for each action. Well, we don't know what Jesus did. But this development of language, now it is interesting that man has in any and every culture, no matter how primitive, highly complex method of communicating of ideas. And I don't care how primitive or ignorant that particular culture may be, their languages are highly developed in the ability to communicate their ideas, whether they do it through grunts, through a sing-song or whatever, they are able to communicate their ideas no matter how primitive their culture. This certainly is something that separates man from the animal kingdom. There is nothing in the animal kingdom that even approximates a complex form of communication of ideas. But yet in the most primitive culture of man and in every culture of man, there is a language communication. So, this was the beginning of the separation of languages. Now, after the separation into the basic language groups, there, of course, have become modifications even within the same language or generalized language. We find the Romance languages and similarities between the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Italian and the French. We find that there is certain similarities between... Uh, the German and, and Scandinavian. We find that English is a language that has borrowed much from Latin and from Greek. So there have been developed languages from the basic language systems. But God divided their languages and Instantly, they no doubt got together in groups that they could communicate to. 
the family groups and so forth, where they could communicate to each other, but it caused the division and the separation and that spreading out then into the world and scattering abroad upon the face of the earth that is described. Now, we're going to zero in down to Abraham because that's where our story must move. So these are the generations of Shem. Getting now again a repetition of the generations of Shem, but moving definitely just down towards Abraham. He was a hundred years old. And he begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. He lived after he begat Arphaxad 500 years and he begat sons and daughters. So he lived to be about 600 years old approximately. Arphaxad lived five, 35 years, begat Salah, and we get, uh, he begat Eber and we follow uh, down uh, to uh, Abraham and actually that's the one where we're coming to so let's go on to verse 26. Terah lived 70 years and he begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now whether or not this is the order in which they were born, we do not know. Whether or not, uh, you know, how old was Terah when Abram was born, we do not know. Maybe he was the third son. Uh, we have no way of knowing. But he lived 70 years and he had these three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now he lived after that for many years also. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of the nativity in the earth of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. So their brother Haran died early, having married and born one son, Lot. He actually bore some daughters too. Uh, and they took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah for she was also the daughter of Haran. So he married his niece. And the father of Milcah and the father of Iscah. But Sarah was barren and she had no child. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran. So, with Haran dead, Lot being his son, Abram sort of adopted Lot because Abram didn't have any sons of his own. So he sort of adopted Lot and Lot became uh, a, a, a journeyer with Abram. But they all together went from the Ur of the Chaldees. Now it was in the Ur of the Chaldees in this area where this false religious systems be pantheism and polytheism and all began to develop and the, the uh, perverted religious systems. And so they left the Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. Now, the fact that they all left to go to Canaan means that in the beginning it could be that Abraham's father also received a call of God to leave and get out of this uh, area that had begun to become religiously polluted and to come into a whole new area. But Terah, uh, they came as far as Haran and there they dwelt. And the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. Now, there is a seeming contradiction of Scripture here when you get into the New Testament and Stephen is uh, talking about Abraham being called of God to leave the Ur of the Chaldees and to go to uh, Israel. How that after he said Terah died, Abraham then went on to Canaan. But when you start putting the ages together, you find that Abram actually left. If, if, if Terah lived to be uh, 205 years old and he was seven years old when Abram was born, then, and Abram was 75 when he left, the 75 and the 70 makes 145 years, and yet he lived to be 205 years old. So you have a discrepancy in mathematics here. 
So what is the solution or what is the answer? There are a couple possible suggestions. Number one, Abraham may not have been the firstborn son. They may not be listed in the order of their births, but in the order of the precedence of their sons. And Abraham could have been born many years after, in other words, 70 years, and, and maybe Haram was born when he was 70 years old. And it doesn't give his age at the time of Abraham's birth. That's one possibility. So that Abraham was sort of a late child and that indeed uh, by the time he was 75 his father was 205 years old. It's very possible. Another possibility is that Stephen is talking in sort of a spiritual sense that he died. You remember one day a young fellow came to Jesus and said, I'll follow you but allow me first to go bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Come and follow me. Now, the let me first bury my father was a common term. It didn't mean that his father was dead. It isn't that Jesus is showing a disrespect or a father who had died. But it is a term whereby a person was saying, I don't want to do it now, I want to wait until my father dies. It's just a, a term of procrastination or putting something off until later. In other words, I want to do it later. Wait till my father dies. Your father can be alive and healthy. He may be Good for another 50, 60 years. But it was a term of procrastination, a common term of procrastination. Now, knowing the use of Jesus in this term and the ideas that were given by it, it could be that Stephen is using it in the same sense and that Terah, when they came to Haran, died spiritually because Terah began to actually apostatize and became also a worshiper of false gods. So it could be that he's referring to the spiritual death of Terah when he turned into spiritual apostasy and it was at that point when Terah spiritually was dead unto God that Abraham realized he had to make his journey alone and he took off with, his, with Lot and the servants and so forth and his wife Sarah and they began then to journey on to the land that God had promised to show him. Actually, going from the area of the Ur of the Chaldees, going to Haran, they were going about 600 miles north, west. It was about 400 miles from Haran down to the land of Canaan, to the area of Shechem, where he was ultimately to end up. But Abraham started off journeying in obedience to God from the earth of the Chaldees. They're, they stopped with his father. It could be that his dad said, hey, this is good. Let's settle here. Let's settle in this area. It's nice. It's, you know, it's, it's productive and all. Let's settle here. And there was a spiritual death of Terah through the call of God and awareness of God. There was a spiritual death and Stephen could be referring to that. When Terah died, then that spiritual death, Abraham realized that he had to leave now his father and that family and journey on by himself to the land that God had promised to show him. So, uh, don't cast off your faith because of a bit of mathematics here. There are possible explanations for it and which one is correct, of course, we don't know. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy family. So Abraham really wasn't totally disobedient at this point. And, and this to me is interesting because Abraham is always held as the model of faith in the New Testament. The model of a man who believed and trusted God. 
He's the prime example of a man who believes. And so many times when we read about faith and the exploits of faith, we think, oh, but I'm so weak and I've blown it so many times. Surely I can't do it. It's good to know that Abraham wasn't perfect. Nor was his faith perfect. It's good to know that you don't have to be perfect and your faith doesn't have to be perfect for God to honor you. So God said, get away from your family. He took his dad with him from the year of the Chaldees to Haran. It was an incomplete obedience. Stopping at Haran was incomplete obedience to God. So even men noted as men of faith have their moments. And just because you slip back and have your moments, doesn't mean that God won't honor you and honor your faith or that God doesn't love you and wants to still work in a powerful way in your life. Just because you blow it and you stop at Haran, it doesn't mean that the call of God is going to be removed and there's no chance for you to go on and fulfill that which God has laid upon your life and your heart to do. Many people have stopped at Haran. But the time came for him to move on, which he did. Maybe the time has come for you to move on from your heron. The Lord said, Get thee out of thy country, from thy father's family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. So, by the very virtue of the fact that Terah went with him, it could be the old man was saying, Oh, no, don't leave. I, I, you know, well, I want to go with you, son. Well, it could be Abraham was just saying, Well, okay, Dad, all right, you know, and... And he could have been weak in this area. But then his dad began to drag him down and slow him down until his father died spiritually following after the pagan practices and Abraham moved on. I will make of thee, God said, a great nation. Now God is establishing covenant with Abraham. You get away from your family, your father's house, the land that I'll show you, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. All of these promises God fulfilled to Abraham. He made of him a great nation. God has blessed him and made the name of Abraham great. It's honored and respected. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And from that is the promise that the Messiah would come from Abraham. In thee, all the families of the earth, not just the Jews, but all the families of the earth will be blessed from Abraham's progeny, even Jesus Christ. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him and Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go to the land of Canaan and into the land of Canaan they came. 400 mile journey, which in those days uh, with all of the animals and everything else must have taken quite a long time indeed. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanites, or the descendants of Canaan, were then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now the promise of giving the land to Abraham's seed at this point would also include the Palestinians. Because the Arabs also were descendants of Abraham through Ishmael. So at this point, the land is promised not just to the Jews, but also to thy seed, which would include the Arabs. Palestinians. But later on, when God repeats it to Jacob, it excludes the Arabs. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai or Ai on the east. 
Now, when Joshua came in later to conquer the land, uh, this, he came up from Jericho and conquered Ai and then on to Bethel. Abraham now has a favorite spot there near Bethel and between Bethel and Ai. It's the highest part of, of, of the land in that particular area. It gives you just a fabulous view. It's about 10 miles north of Jerusalem and about 20 miles or so from Shechem. But from there, you can see down into the Jordan Valley. You can see up towards the area of Samaria. You can see Jerusalem and the area south. You can look over towards the Mediterranean. It just is a beautiful vantage point in that mountainous area between Bethel and Ai. And when Abraham came uh, to this area, he built an altar and the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto thy seed, I give this sign, and he built this altar unto the Lord and called on the name of the Lord and Abram journey going on down now to the south. And there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was grievous in the land. So there was a drought in the... Of course, he went on south towards Beersheba. There's always a drought down there. The place is really dry. It's deserty. And it came to pass when he was come near to Egypt that he said to Sarah, his wife, now here's our great man of faith, our example. Behold, now I know that you're a beautiful woman to look upon. Hey, that's saying a lot to your wife when she's 65 years old. (laughs) But because of the longevity at 65, you were still really, you know, in, in your prime of youth, in a sense, or beauty. Uh, Abram lived to be over 160, so uh, at 65, you're really not that old yet in those times. But it, it does, you know, when you think of 65 years old and talking about her great beauty, uh, it does sound indeed very interesting. I know that you're a beautiful woman to look upon. Therefore, when it comes to pass, when the Egyptians will see you, they will say, this is his wife. And they will kill me and keep you alive. They'll take you into their harems. Now, this was a common practice among the Egyptian kings is to just, if a man, if he saw, if he saw a beautiful woman, he'd kill her husband and, and, and take her as his wife. And uh, so he said, I pray that uh, you'll tell them that you are my sister, that it might be well with me for thy sake and my soul shall live because of thee. Hey, this is our great man of faith, Abraham. You see, even great men of faith have their weaknesses and their moments. Now that encourages me. For some silly reason. Because I also have my moments of weaknesses. But I have the concept that when I get weak, God just says, all right, that's it, you had your chance, you know, wipe out. But not so. God continued to honor Abraham. God continued to bless Abraham. He wasn't perfect. God doesn't use perfect people because they don't exist. So don't worry that you're not perfect. Don't think that God is going to reject you because you're not perfect. Don't think that God can't use you because you're not perfect. God blessed Abraham. God used Abraham though he had his lapses of faith just like we have our lapses of faith. So it came to pass that when Abraham was come to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very beautiful. And the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and they commended her before the Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into the Pharaoh's house. And he treated Abraham or he treated Abraham well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and asses, men servants, maid servants, she asses, camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah Abram's wife. And the Pharaoh called Abram and said, What have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her to be my wife. Now behold, your wife, take her, go your way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him 
And they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So he, he came under then a special protective edict of the Pharaoh uh, so that uh, he would not fall prey to the men uh, in order that they might take Sarah, his wife. So, an introduction now to Abraham. We're beginning now to follow and we will from now on follow Abraham as we come on down towards Christ as the Bible now is the developing of the nation and from the nation the coming forth of the Savior of the world. So next week we'll continue on beginning with chapter 13. Shall we stand? God bless you and enrich your heart and your mind and the things of the Spirit. Giving you understanding of His Word. And may God increase your faith and your knowledge and understanding of Him. God go with you and bless you and watch over you and keep you in all your ways. Strengthening you and ministering to you through His love, in Jesus' name. This is the end of Side 2 and the end of this message. If you would like further information on tapes or our free catalog, contact the Word for Today. The address is P.O. Box 8000, Costa Mesa, California, 92628. Or you may reach us by our toll-free number, 1-800-272-WORD. That's 1-800-272-WORD.